But now as I'm living in Malindi, mm. I started meeting people. Mm. I met a couple of people who I think are going to be important. Mm. One, I went to the club one time. Mm. Um, and a young, I was alone. Mm. I just went and sat at the uh, club mm. in Malindi. Mm. I'm watching people dancing and mm. whatnot, and then a young lady comes and says, buy me a beer. Mm. I said, sure, mm. I'll buy you a beer mm. if you sit here and talk to me. Mm. So she sat down, talked to me, mm. gave me stories about the community around mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, and as we were talking, I said, you know, but you, you're Malindian as well. I'm Malindian. I, I, I probably know even your people. Mm. Um, you I don't know, but mm. I think, you know, I know where you come from, so mm -hmm. I must know some of your people, mm. having grown up here. Mm. Um, and she says, I'm from Shela, which is Malindi's old town. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, Shela? Mm. I know Shela well. Mm. Where in Shela? Mm. So we pinpoint her, her immediate neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, so if this is your immediate neighborhood, which is your house? Because mm. I know all these guys, there's mm. this family, that family. Mm. In fact, when you go up there, that that family, down mm. here, this family. Mm. So she realized, yeah, you know these people. Mm. So she says, yeah, you know, so Ali, mm. let's say, is my, is my dad. Mm. Now, this Ali is somebody I know. Mm. And he has, he, when I was last with him, maybe 15 years before, he didn't have a child. Mm. How does he have a child? Uh, did he have a child I didn't know about? Mm. I said, I said it to her, I said, mm. I, I don't understand, Dali didn't have a child. Mm. And she says, yeah. And eventually I realized it's a question of age. So I said, how old are you? And she became very jittery. I said, mm. listen, I am not judging you. Just tell me how old you are. In fact, mm. I have another beer. <laughs> tell me how old you are. Mm. And I learned that she's 13. And I, I am shocked, of course. And I asked her, so how are you here? She says, yeah, I've been coming here since I was 11 and a half. Been doing this for one and a half years. Mm. And I said, so what are you doing? She says, I'm looking for money. So I discover that in the coast, mothers are sending their children out into the club as young as 13. Wow. So that they can go and become prostitutes. Mm. So that they can find a little something for the house. Mm. She is brought there by her older sisters who are not much older. Mm. Or cousins and so on. Mm. And then, so that is one story that sticks with me. Mm. And I start, I've constantly been asking myself, so what can I do? Mm. Later I go into Shella mm. to see old friends and so on. Mm. And I discovered that there are no young people, young men, mm -hmm. between the ages of, I want to say, 14 to 25, mm -hmm. they have disappeared. So I said, where are the young men? And I was told, well, they are not there because they have gone to four places. One, they have gone to jail mm -hmm. because of selling drugs. Mm. Two, they have uh, gone to Arabia. Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. or uh, Qatar or Dubai or mm. wherever, mm. Warabuni as we say, mm -hmm. to look for work. Yeah. Or they are dead because of taking drugs. Mm. Or they have joined the Al Shabaab. Mm. And it is possible for you to be to have joined the Al Shabaab and died. Yeah. Because I understand the way that it, it works is that if your son disappears, because they never say that they are going. Mm. But if they disappear and they have stayed away for a long time, then mm. in that case they have joined the Al Shabab. Mm. When eventually um, they jihadize themselves and they commit some kind of suicide or whatever, mm. or they go into a mission and are killed, mm. then what generally happens is that um, the Al Shabab come into the town mm. through somebody mm. and they say, you know what, we have prepared that house for you. Mm. Um, as a family, mm. um, or rather your son mm. has prepared that house for you as a family mm. and he has just sent us to make sure that you have it mm. and uh, you'll be getting, collecting all the rent on that house for mm. the rest of your life. Mm. What they don't know is that he's probably passed on. Most the, likely. Nobody ever tells them that the truth is your son has died. Mm. Yes.
Mm. Okay. Mm. But they are be- some of them have an inkling that that is what is happening. Mm. So that's one. One of the so the the young men. So there's this story of the you know the ladies are being brought into sex work much earlier, mm. and then young men are not around because they are in one of these four places. Correct. All right. Now, in addition to that, mm-hmm. I have met a woman called Mama Furaha, mm-hmm. who is 40 years old, mm-hmm. does not know how to read and write, dropped out of school in standard three, does not have an ID, does not have M-Pesa, does not have a phone. Mm-hmm. I did a little bit of research on that, mm. and I found out that out of the 60, 658 women that I spoke to, mm. more than half did not have IDs. In Malindi? In Malindi. So no form of identification. So no are they even operating um, like yeah. mobile money and the phone number is in somebody else's name. A oh, husband, the husband a friend, brother, mm-hmm. someone. Mm. Yes. And they go to a specific impasse shop that Oh that them. will not require. And that will not demand for an ID. Yeah. Yes. Foof. Okay. Mm. Mama Furaha has fifteen children. You say she's 40 what? She's 40. What's the, like, so when, the, the birth spacing, what are we talking Very about small. in terms of birth spacing, in terms of uh, first child? Ha! Ah, yes. My goodness. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at a, a family like that, mm. and she's supported by a husband who has the same sort of situation, mm. then what happens? Yeah. These people are not visible by government. Yeah. Those three people that I've talked to you about. Those three categories. Those are personas. That they are personas that nobody knows about. Yeah. In this development sector, we don't. We only deal with them in the abstract. Mm. We don't deal with them in the. In Their the, stories are, are we, invisible. We, we kind of know unheard. that these tro- stories are there. Yeah. But until I tell you, it is Mama Furaha. Programming and policy prioritization will not be for them. Exactly. Mm. So now. The Open Institute is working on trying to figure out how we can collect data from all of these people who are indivisible. And give them give them visibility. Give them visibility. Mm. And then also give them the power to speak to government and say, you guys have let us down. And, and these are our issues. And these are our issues. Hmm. Yes. Okay. So now if you if you look at all of those things, that, that's where my career has culminated to. Mm. It's culminated to us trying to figure out how do we make a difference in Africa mm. in more real ways? Mm. How do we not be so politically correct that we don't actually solve real problems? Of the people who are of the people who on need the ground. These problems. Yeah. Mm. And how do we make sure that the development space gets out of the capital cities? And out, out of the bubble of and out of the of, bubble of, of middle class and lower middle class, yes. but into the people who to where, right to where they are needed. Mm. If we can be able to succeed to do that, then I think that we are going to be very successful. No, we will be. But now the challenge is mm. is that it requires for us to change ourselves. Uh, by our, in this case, you are you are saying, saying us the, in the development, in the development space, the people in the social impact yes. world. Yeah. It requires for us to change ourselves. Mm. And it's very uncomfortable to change ourselves in the way that I'm suggesting. What's the call to action? Because I'm basically saying Mm -hmm. that, number one, Mm -hmm. majority of these organizations are set up in Nairobi. They shouldn't be. They should be set up in some rural areas. Decentralize them to Samburu, uh, Trukana. The CEO of the organization, Mm. even if he decides to have an office here in Nairobi, Mm. he should spend the majority of his time outside of Nairobi. In those places where people are, and that's the top leadership, and that's the top leadership. Yeah, if you have not, top not le- an officer, somewhere not officers. in uh, a county officer. Yes, no, the, the the actual CEO. You know, one of the earlier episodes of DD with Maxi was with Dr. Gidinji. One of the things that I found very very profound is that he said he spends majority of his time with the communities mm. in Kenya and Amref Health Africa is around the Africa with mm. communities around and if you actually follow his work you'll see the same you yeah. know with 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 communities in Kibera communities everywhere and that's what you're referring to yes. just with communities I'm saying people need to decentralize themselves yeah and to make sure that they actually operate from those communities mm. because there's going to be impact for them mm. 
in terms of how they deliver on the programs. Yeah. In terms of how community owns what they are doing. Mm. Yeah. But it has to be a genuine engagement yeah. between them and the community. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we uh, we are working. That's on. the first thing. Yeah. Now the second thing that mm. that um, I am kind of I want to say pushing for mm-hmm. is I'm aiming for this space in which we can begin to focus our attention on the young people mm-hmm. on the continent mm. and give them enough power mm-hmm. so that they become the people who are driving the development space. Mm. They become the people who are giving us ideas because you know where we are going. We are going into a into a space that Mark Zuckerberg called the metaverse where suddenly virtual becomes Trump's physical. Mm. Our homes are going to be smart homes. Mm. The jobs that currently exist today, half of them will not. Mm. And there's a whole bunch of new jobs that are coming to replace them. Mm. But we are not preparing our kids for this. Mm. We are not preparing our young people for this. We need to now create proper structures to work with these young guys so that they can start to work in unusual places. The only way we start working in unusual places, in unusual organizations, is by making sure that we ourselves are engaged at that level. At Open Institute, how are you doing that? At Open Institute, the one thing that we're doing is that we've increased our engage, uh, engagement with like um, young folk significantly. We are meeting with 21-year-old uh, Benjamin, who is um, who is married to a 19-year-old and they have a 5-year-old, 4-year-old child, mm. right? Mm-hmm. We are working with um, a young lady who has an organization where she's been on her own time um, working with young people in Malindi mm. to learn how to read and write mm. and to learn how to do more than just read and write mm. to get them to understand financial literacy and so on. Mm. Jackie Mungai is 26 years old. Mm. So those are the guys that we are beginning to push our support towards mm. because they are working directly at community level. Mm. They have the trust of the community mm. and we think that they are the ones who are going to deliver on our programs mm. in ways that we are not able, ever going to be able to. And and, and I, I also really wish that um, those of us who have been around for a while would also get out of the way a little bit more. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, like so that they, as you're saying in your second point, so that they, if, we are, if, the, if truly the metaverse universe uh, and the future is with the young people the, the the present and the future is being driven by the young people yes. we can also we, ca- we we can't also be jostling for it for, we, yes. we need to be we need to let true meaningful youth adult part- partnerships happen where it's youth who are leading us and letting us know the direction is this yes you know and we are coming in as as um, sort of like support advisors exactly not necessarily as the ones who are just lean to lead which is uh, and we a need new to recognize dimension. that our our role is actually that of support advisors and not exactly bosses and telling them exactly because they they kind of know where the country should go yeah yeah, yeah. Um, if we if it is possible for us to drive change at that level i think we're going to do great mm, mm. i have such big hopes for the future to be honest yeah. i have such Especially for an African future, I think like just the same way that when I was young, I I thought that Africa was a place to, I mm. mean Nairobi was a place to be, mm. and that we should stay in Kenya and not emigrate. Mm. It's the same way that I think about, about Africa, Africa now. Mm. I think that we are at the cusp of something mm. unusual, mm. and I'm I, I'm like excited about it. That is so good. I'm excited about where it is going. I'm that excited so about good. what that's going to look like, mm. because. You know, there's that car that is in Nakuru mm. that was built by someone. Mm. We have to go buy it mm. so that that exactly. car becomes a car yeah. because yeah. he needs the money. Yeah. We have to create back orders exactly. and put in deposit exactly. so that that guy can put in yeah. more work and yeah. build that car. Yeah. We have to go support him yeah. because that's our car. that is going to be the Kenyan car. It is. It is. You see what I mean? Yeah. So <laughs> the, the thing that we need to recognize that the people who are building cars like that are so many yeah and they are and they they're everywhere yeah if we can find them yeah and we start buying these things from them yeah we'll change everything it is it, it is indeed an exciting future